Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. My parents lived in a small town near the ocean. It was an incredibly beautiful place that won my love from an early age. They were amazing scenery. I never wanted to leave here. Surfing was my favorite pastime. From an early age, I learned to conquer the waves. It was my element. In this direction, I also earned. I have taught surfboard courses and also sold surfboards and some other water sports equipment. My life was pretty full, a lot of friends. But with the second half, I did not develop in any way. Girls were in my life, but I could not have a serious relationship. But the situation changed when I met Cynthia. It was great weather to hit the waves on the coast. I had already moved far enough from the shore to meet the big waves. And then a big wave began to approach, I began to swim towards it. Then I successfully rode the wave and floated along its crest. In the distance, I noticed a girl who also tried to ride, but something went wrong. The wave covered the girl. Only the board remained on the surface of the water. The girls were not visible on the surface of the water. I quickly swam up to this board and dived under the water. I saw that the girl was unconscious underwater. I pulled her to the surface and then dragged her to the shore. It is very good that the situation happened close to the coast. There was still time to save the girl. I started CPR and the girl woke up spitting out water. Girl, how do you feel? I asked with concern. Thank you very much, young man. Can you breathe? Yes, I can already. Thanks for saving me. The girl answered frightened. What's happened? I wanted to conquer this wave, but I slipped and hit my head on the board and then I don't remember anything. Are you sick? Is your head spinning a lot? Yes, I'm very unwell. I understand, you probably have a concussion. You need to go to the hospital. Let me help you get there. Thanks a lot. The girl was still in a stressful state. She did not have time to move away from the shock. I helped her get to the nearest medical station on the coast. Doctors examined her there. The girl began to recover. Young man, I don't know how to thank you for saving my life. Don't worry about it. The main thing is that you survived. Now everything will be fine. What is your name? The girl asked with a smile. My name is Daniel. Nice to meet you, Daniel. My name is Cynthia. Mutually, Cynthia. Daniel, I insist on thanking you. You are my hero. Let me come to my senses a little and we can meet with you in a couple of days. At least I'll get you some coffee. Leave your phone number, please. And I left Cynthia my phone number. A couple of days later, she really called me and we met. It was a very pretty girl. Her black silky hair lay beautifully on delicate shoulders. And big brown eyes beckoned me, I could not resist them. When we met, we walked for a long time along the embankment, a light breeze and a warm wind enveloped us all the time. It was quite easy to communicate with Cynthia, I immediately liked her very much. After this meeting, we both wanted to see each other again. And our meetings lasted about two years and then we got married with Cynthia. I did not have time to come to my senses as 15 years had already passed in marriage with Cynthia. We lived together all this time. My small business was gaining momentum, it turned out to make good money. And I bought a new house in a wonderful place overlooking a wild beach. This is where our family life took place. But lately, Cynthia has been acting a little strange. She increasingly went for a walk alone and I increasingly wanted to be alone with her at home. I often had to pick up a tipsy Cynthia from bars at night. It was not constant, but nevertheless such situations arose and everything ended in a quarrel. And then Cynthia apologized and promised not to do that again. I began to suspect Cynthia of treason, but she firmly stood her ground and accused me of being too suspicious. One day I went to visit Stephen, my friend. Cynthia and I often visited him. Stephen was a lonely guy, he was unlucky in love relationships. Cynthia and I felt sorry for him, always telling him that the time had not yet come when that one and only woman would appear in his life. This time I went to see Stephen myself. We decided to have a beer on his summer terrace. I had an urge to go to the toilet and I went into the house to go to the restroom. I was already slightly tipsy and inaccurately caught a coffee table with my foot from which a magazine and some other papers fell. I bent down to pick everything up and suddenly I saw earrings. These were the same earrings that I gave my wife for our wedding anniversary. Cynthia had wanted them for a long time and constantly hinted to me that I should give them to her. I collected money and bought these earrings. I was dumbfounded. What are these earrings doing here? Had Cynthia forgotten them here? 
Or had they rolled and she hadn't seen them since she'd had a wild night with Stephen? I became terribly uncomfortable with these thoughts. I was already drunk enough and decided not to say anything to Stephen now. If Cynthia lied to me, Stephen would have lied to me by now. And Stephen unexpectedly got ahead of me. Daniel, listen, I completely forgot about the time. We had a good time today, but I completely forgot that I have an appointment for today, so I have to ask you to leave. Stephen said when I returned to his terrace. Who do you have an appointment with? I asked anxiously. So it does not matter. With one person. Do you want to tell your friend who you will be seeing? It's a secret? I started asking questions. No, Daniel, this is not a secret. I will definitely tell everything, but let's do it another time. Stephen literally pushed me out of the house with no clear explanation. This greatly alarmed me. Was Cynthia coming to see him now? I was furious. I started calling Cynthia, but she didn't pick up. A wave of anxiety washed over me and clouded my mind. I decided to follow who would still come to Stephen. I noticed a taxi pull into Stephen's yard. The windows were tinted and I could not see who drove up to him. I climbed over the fence and headed for Stephen's house, anger and rage seething. The front door was not closed. I went inside the house. There was no one on the first floor. I looked around and suddenly heard women's moans on the second floor. I ran up the stairs to the second floor and burst into the room. Well, bitches, so I caught you. I screamed as I burst into the room. The naked girl screamed and covered herself with a blanket. Much to my surprise, it wasn't Cynthia. Daniel, what the hell are you doing here? Stephen yelled. Stephen. I thought you had Cynthia here, I'm sorry. I answered confused. Stephen, who is this? The girl screamed. Calm down, dear, this is my friend who apparently drank too much today. Danielle, what the hell would Cynthia do for me? What, you thought I was here with her? Are you completely crazy? Stephen spoke furiously. Sorry, Stephen, guys, sorry to ruin your evening. I just found Cynthia's earrings in your bathroom, what the hell are they doing there? So you took the earrings? It was supposed to be a present for Victoria whom you scared by breaking in here. Here's the box, receipt, and tag if you don't believe me. And I've been looking for them all evening. I forgot to put it back in the box and thought I had already lost it. Friend, I'm sorry, I really went nuts, it's just that Cynthia has exactly the same ones. Yes, I know, she advised me to buy them, she told me where you bought them. I'm an asshole. Stephen, Victoria, forgive me, I really had too much to drink. I will not disturb you and leave immediately. I put the earrings on the table and went outside. I felt guilty, and I was terribly uncomfortable. Stephen later forgave me, I asked him not to tell Cynthia anything. It's been a few weeks since this situation. Cynthia stopped bothering me, everything began to improve, and I decided to put these stupid speculations out of my head. To calm my nerves, I also swam under the waves on the board. On this day, I rowed for a very long time. I returned to my boat and decided to rest a bit. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a motor. I raised my head and saw a yacht. It was David's boat. It was a local bastard who was engaged in dubious business. Earlier, I already crossed paths with him. Our meeting ended with the fact that I almost nailed him on the spot. He was involved in drugs and offered dope to my clients. But now I was worried about something else. At the bow of the yacht, I spotted Cynthia. She was lying on a sunbed in a black bathing suit. I didn't believe my eyes. I took out the binoculars and took a closer look. But it really was her. But what did she do with that bastard? I was not going to go home and wait for Cynthia at home. I followed this yacht. It was already evening and it was starting to get dark. The yacht moored in the distance. I swam quietly to the yacht at low speed so that my motor could not be heard. We were already quite far from the shore. Apparently Cynthia wasn't going home at all today. I carefully climbed aboard the yacht, there was no one outside. Those bastards were in the cabin together. I quietly went down to the cabin and heard groans. At this point, I clearly recognized Cynthia. I burst into the cabin. David fucked my wife dirty, perched on top of her. I ran up and threw him off Cynthia. Dirty bastards. So I didn't suspect you for nothing, whore. I yelled and slapped Cynthia in the face. What are you doing here, you bastard? David jumped to his feet. Restoring justice, stoned cattle. Do you think that just like that you will fuck my wife and nothing will happen to you? You were very wrong. 
What are you going to do to me, Daniel? David asked with a grin. Oh, bitch, you can't even imagine what I'll arrange for you, but first get it. I shouted and with all my strength loaded this bastard in the face. David fell again, I sat on top of him and hit his blunt head several times again, blood spattered on Cynthia and she screamed in hysterics. What bitch, is this how you repaid me for my care? Daniel, please forgive me. No, I'm tired of hearing it. After this, you will not be forgiven. And what do we have here? I said, opening a large box in which there was a lot of drugs. David, you sick bastard. Are you carrying all this rubbish with you on a yacht? I've never met a dumber idiot. Don't touch it, bitch. I have to give this box to serious people. They'll be here soon and you'll wish you hadn't come here. David yelled with a bloodied mouth. Shut your mouth, you jerk. You don't have to worry about this. I said, taking out a canister of gasoline standing near the engine compartment. What? What are you doing? What did you think? In hysterics started yelling David. Do not you see? I per gasoline on your wretched yacht. It's going to be hot in here today. No. Do not do that. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. David tried to stop me. I don't give a shit. I would love to see what the people you promised this product would do to you. And now you both have exactly one minute to jump overboard. Otherwise, I'll burn you along with the yacht. I said and again knocked David down with a blow to the head. Frightened bastards interfering with each other tried to get out of the cabin along a narrow corridor with steps up. I heard them jump into the water. I, too, calmly climbed on deck, threw down the match, and climbed onto my boat. Here you bastards one life bua for two. To your attention, a landmark in the form of a lighthouse on the coast, I advise you to hurry. I said, untying my boat from the burning yacht. I floated away to the screams in agony of David, who, apparently, knew well what they could do to him for this drug. A little later, I heard the explosion of the yacht. But I did not burn the drugs, but took them with me so that these bastards would not see. I filmed the bastards on the boat along with the drugs. I had a good friend in the narcotics department. David couldn't be caught for a long time. And now there will be excellent evidence to put this bastard behind bars. I called my friend and told him everything. The task force quickly left for the scene. They found those bastards still in the water and took them away. At first I was also under suspicion, but my friend helped to remove all these suspicions from me. I helped cover a large illegal network because David sang like a bird when he was charged with indisputable evidence he surrendered absolutely everyone who was involved in this case in order to at least slightly knock off his sentence. It was a pretty big operation. Cynthia was also dragged through the courts, her fate was rather gloomy. And my life continued on, I still enjoyed the huge waves, but only without false traitors in my life. Thank you for listening to this story, now here is another exciting story for you to read. I sometimes go over my past life in my head and wonder if I was lucky. My wife Christy and I used to live in the big city in a small one-room apartment. We both worked in manufacturing, that's where we met and got married a little later. For 13 or so years our life was relatively stable. We had been saving little by little, dreaming of buying our dream home and adopting a child. Christy couldn't have children, but I didn't love her any less for that. That's how we lived. But one day our fate took an unexpected turn. Downsizing at the factory was a real blow to us. Having lost our jobs, we felt the bitter reality of unemployment. But we did not give up. We sent out our resumes incessantly and went for interviews. But to no avail. We began to go through a rough patch in our lives. We had to take money from our savings. A few months went by and when all seemed lost, the unexpected happened. Christy received a letter from the notary. Her uncle, whom we hadn't seen in years, had passed away, leaving her his inheritance. The letter spoke of a house in the countryside that now belonged to her. She appeared to be the sole heiress. We just couldn't believe our luck. Uncle, of course, pity, but it was an opportunity to start from scratch. We decided to sell our apartment and moved into our new house. Life there turned out to be just wonderful with no noise and bustle of the city, peace and quiet. I decided to become a writer. It was the right time for that. Christy finished her design courses and began working remotely. A year later, I published my first book. My publisher helped me well and the profits were sufficient for our existence. Everything seemed to be working out and we could finally enjoy life. I had already started talking about having a baby again. But for some reason, Christy no longer had any desire to start a family. 
she was content with what she had. She liked it. She worked from home. Occasionally she'd go into town on business, and I noticed she was starting to drift away from me. I decided to have a picnic near the house on a beautiful lawn with a nice view. Chris, I noticed something bothering you. I can see that you've been sad lately. Share it with me. It's okay. It's just that the new job is a little tiring. I mean, I've lived my whole life differently. Don't mind me. We continued our vacation outdoors and she talked about her work trying to act casual. One day I decided to go into town more just to take a drive and see how things had changed during our absence. I visited some familiar places and decided to visit the fair which had just opened. As I wandered between the entertainment booths, I noticed my wife. My surprise then took over when I decided to approach her and saw that she was not alone but in the company of a man dressed in an expensive suit. Hello, Christy. I went over to them. Oh, hello. I didn't expect to see you here. I noticed she was a little confused. I thought I'd go out. Who's your friend? I looked at him questioningly. This is Elliot. We work in the same firm and now we have a new project together. Elliot held out his hand in greeting. Not wanting to seem impolite, I shook it back. Yeah? What's that? Oh, we've been commissioned to do the interior of a new campaign office. He told me. I looked at him and my wife suspiciously, then she abruptly changed the subject. We said a quick goodbye to Elliot and spent some more time at the fair before returning home. Thoughts of her coworker kept me busy. Their presence at the fair was strange. What were the two of them doing there? I couldn't get the questions out of my head. When she was at home, Christy was often on the phone, obviously texting. One day, I noticed that she had left it on the nightstand, obviously having forgotten it, so I decided to sneak a peek. But unfortunately, the phone was on lock and I could not find out anything. Attempts to talk to her again yielded no results. But a strange feeling did not leave me. So I decided not to leave things as they were. I decided to follow her when she was going into town, explaining it was just another business matter. Already in town, I saw her go into some building that looked like an office. I waited a couple of hours in the cafe across the street. When she came out, she wasn't alone. She was accompanied by Elliot. I wondered how their meeting would end, so I continued my surveillance. I saw them heading toward the waterfront where they had their date on a bench under a tall tree. But later I realized that Elliot wasn't just an employee of hers when I saw them kissing. I felt so hurt that I just wanted to drown them. After all, what was she missing? How could she trade me for some guy who wasn't even remotely handsome in person? I wanted to walk right up to them, but for some reason I decided to wait and see how it ended. They didn't stay there long and then they each went their separate ways. I followed Elliot. Hey, hey, wait on. I shouted to him as he was about to enter the office building. He turned to me and looked at me with interest. Yeah, can I help you? Oh, are you the man from the fair? Christie's husband, isn't he? Yes, that's right. I'd like to talk. All right, come on in. He invited me inside. We ended up in an office with expensive furniture. On some of the shelves, in addition to large binders of documents, were the frames of Elliot's acknowledgments and accomplishments. Walking past them, I had time to examine them. So what exactly did you want to tell me? He sat down at the table in a leather chair and with his fingers interlocked in front of him, leaned against the table. I didn't hesitate to walk up to the table, put my fists on the table, and assumed an orangutan pose. Yes, I wanted to talk about my wife. I saw you on the boardwalk. I want you to leave her alone. She's my wife. Oh, so that's what this is about. He grinned. Yes, I knew she was married, but she made her own choice. I liked her very much and she accepted my proposal. I give her a lot. And she's helping me make a good profit. So you have to go. I certainly didn't expect that kind of chutzpah. It's like being in someone else's body and living someone else's life. How do you say that to me? I was beginning to fill with anger now and I felt the blood rush to my temples. Elliot didn't seem to be the type to give up on short notice. And it didn't look like they were in love. But I wasn't going to put up with the role of being a cuckold, so I decided to make things clear. When I demanded that he back off again, he explained that they had a contract with Christy and she couldn't leave him. She was obligated to fulfill the role of his concubine. 
I didn't understand the whole point of his speech, of course, but I was hurt by the concubine thing, and I wanted to attack him with my fists. But, as if on cue, two thugs burst into the office and grabbed me by the arms and took me outside. I realized that I couldn't go inside now, so I decided to go home to have a serious talk with my wife. When I arrived, she was already shamanizing in the kitchen and greeted me with a smile that disappeared almost immediately when Christy saw me angry. I took her by the hand and sat her down at the table. Tell me. What? She looked at me frightened. What do you mean? I notified her of my conversation with Elliot and demanded a detailed explanation. Christy seemed to realize that her secret was out and with a heavy sigh, she decided to confess everything to me but first got me to promise that I would listen to her story to the end. I agreed and she told me that when she was applying, Elliot noticed her abilities and helped her to get the position she wanted. At first, everything was fine but then he challenged her to a frank conversation and demanded intimacy. She, of course, refused. But he showed her a document which stated that I had to provide him with certain services and if I refused, all her property, including the house, would go to him. Christy swore she didn't remember signing that document. Perhaps it was at a party when they were celebrating the completion of one of the projects. Then she did sign something but she thought it was an award receipt form. I became enraged by this. I asked Christy exactly what kind of profit she was making by quoting Elliot. And she told me something that infuriated me even more. She confessed that sometimes she had to please some of Elliot's partners. I jumped up from my chair and started rushing around the kitchen, shouting my indignation alternately with curses. When I asked her how she could have and why she hadn't told me right away, Christy couldn't answer. She admitted that she was ashamed, but she had no choice. I looked at my wife at how calmly she was telling me all this and I thought for a moment that she herself liked what she was doing. My thoughts and feelings were mixed up, I needed to think things through. I scolded my wife for keeping quiet, got a beer out of the fridge, and went outside. I did not sit there very long, parsing the information I had received in my head. I could not leave the situation as it was. My feelings for my wife were different now, I couldn't allow myself to be treated that way. She had stabbed me in the back and I couldn't forgive her for that. When I had calmed down a little and gotten my anger under control, I came up with some plan that would help me get rid of Elliot in some way. I've been thinking for a long time and I had an idea of how to get you out of your freelance duties. Yes? She wondered. And what do you propose? We could transfer all your property to me. That way, when you turn that guy down, he can't take anything away from you. Christy thought about it. She seemed to like the idea. And soon she agreed. We consulted a lawyer, and of course, I had to tell him the truth. But he confirmed my story and helped us with the paperwork. Now half the job was done. I had the peace of mind that I wouldn't have to live on the street again and Christy wouldn't have to be a slut for some uncles. That was it. Now call your cavalier and tell him you won't be doing his bidding anymore. I told my wife, carefully packing the documents in a bag and then hiding them in the safe. Christy obeyed and dialed the number with a trembling hand. I could be yelling here Elliot and threaten the receiver from a distance. Christy froze in fright, but I went over to her when she was done talking and told her not to worry about anything. Already that evening we had a visitor. It was pouring heavily outside when a car pulled up and a man in a long hooded raincoat got out. The doorbell rang. We were sitting in the kitchen and at that moment lightning flashed and thunder rumbled and Christy was frightened like a horror movie heroine. I went to open the door. Elliot stepped across the threshold, rainwater dripping from his raincoat and he dropped it on the floor. I came to get mine. If you two think you can just get rid of me, you're dead wrong. He hissed. Where's the whore? He moved inside the house, but I rushed to stop him. Sometimes he'd managed to sneak under my attacks or fight his way out. Without stopping the fight and the verbal altercation, we made our way to the kitchen where Christy was hiding. Oh, so that's where you are? Do you think you can get rid of me? Not gonna happen. Pack it up. I told you she's not going anywhere. I continued to protest and struck again at the guest's jaw. He grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and pinned me to the kitchen counter. His hands crawled to my neck and I began to feel like I was suffocating. But my life was very precious to me and I wasn't about to say goodbye to it. Pushing my adversary away from me with one hand and rubbing the table with the other, I fumbled for the knife, grabbed it and stabbed it into Elliot with force. His grip began to loosen and I felt like I could breathe into my lungs again. Elliot let go of me and grabbed the knife sticking out of his stomach. 
He stepped back a little, staggering, and soon collapsed to the floor. Christy looked on in horror at what was happening. I stroked my throat, which was now safe. What have you done? She asked me. Did you kill him? For a moment I even thought she felt sorry for him. I went over to her and told her not to worry about anything. Then I went over to the wounded man who was no longer showing any signs of life. I put my fingers to his neck and tried to feel for a pulse but to no avail. Elliot was dead. I sat down in the chair resting my head on my fist. Now I had to get rid of the body. But how? Actually, I hadn't killed him on purpose. It was self-defense. I turned to Christy and told her to call the police myself and ordered her to confirm the version of self-defense. She fortunately agreed. It didn't take us long to get to the station to testify. Still, the angels above blessed us and the police did not press murder charges against me. My actions were recognized as self-defense and my wife and I went home. A week or so passed. I got Christy to quit her job. We tried to live our lives as before, but inside me, the feeling of insult wouldn't go away. I still felt as if I had had my feet rubbed off on me and my feelings for my wife were no longer the same. More accurately, I no longer felt the same love for her, but rather resentment and anger for her actions. I could not forgive her for a long time. One day, I brought her papers to sign. What is it? She asked. They are divorce papers. I can't live with you anymore. You disgust me. I said frankly. But how so? I hoped you forgave me. Because I was a victim of deceit. Victim? I interrupted her. You think you're a victim? But it was you who deceived me and laid down under men without any regret. Go away. But this is my home. She objected. Well, no. Have you forgotten that you gave me all the papers yourself? Everything belongs to me now. Go wherever you want. I felt a kind of relief having thus avenged my wife who had betrayed me. Soon she packed her things and went to her parents and I never saw her again. And I decided to write another book in which I told my story. Dear viewers, thank you for staying with us and supporting our channel. See you again.